I used to feel genuinely satisfied with my life, enjoying a comfortable income and managing everything well, until one day I was blindsided. My credit card company called to alert me about a $91,000 charge that I didn't recognize. I was utterly stunned and immediately stopped the payment. Around the same time, my husband Jason, who was traveling, called me repeatedly, despite the chaos. I took charge of the situation. At 31, I'm a manager at my company, while Jason, also 31 and my college sweetheart, has been married to me for two years. Unlike many of our friends who left their jobs after getting married, I chose to stay in mine. I earn more than Jason, which sometimes gives me pause about our future, especially considering how unstable his income can be. We value our financial independence, managing our own finances and sharing household expenses equally. This setup allows me the freedom to spend my leftover income as I please which usually doesn't bother me since we're both working and life is generally good. However, during a recent train ride home, I had a nagging feeling that I might have overspent. As I checked a debit alert on my phone, I considered looking for any unused subscriptions still draining my account, but the thought slipped away as I struggled to recall the password for my credit card portal. It's tough to find the motivation to sort this out and contacting the help center is no small feat. They're only available from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekdays, exactly when most working people can't make a call. The long wait times during lunch hours don't help either. Still, I find some comfort in knowing that if a significant issue arises, like a charge over $40,000, the call center will reach out to me. This trust in the system makes me a bit complacent about reaching out myself. In the meantime, online shopping offers a brief escape from work-related stresses. When I opened a freshly delivered package, a surge of excitement washed over me, but that feeling faded as soon as I stepped into our living room. The sight instantly dampened my mood, socks strewn across the floor, empty cans cluttering the table, and a random phone and sweater carelessly tossed on the couch. Yes, that was my husband, lounging in a sweatshirt seemingly oblivious to the mess surrounding him. Jason has a knack for leaving things undone, and it often feels like he's deliberately contributing to the chaos at home. I pointed my phone at the couch, half joking and half exasperated, and said, Hey, socks and empty cans? This is what I come home to? It's not that hard to tidy up a bit or even cook dinner if you're home before me. His response was cool and dismissive. If you get home early, why don't you clean the house? Don't be so mad about it. That stung. I'm tired too when I get home. I replied, trying to keep my tone light yet firm. If you're not going to help clean, maybe you should think about whether you prefer working or doing chores. Please, just drop it. He said, not once, but twice, his annoyance clear. Yet he didn't seem to grasp the weight of my words. I shot him a stern look, but he was too absorbed in his phone to notice my frustration. It felt unfair that I was carrying the heavier load of chores and work. Was I being unreasonable? I wasn't sure, but I feared my confrontation might push him to be even more indifferent about our home's upkeep. Surprisingly, after that exchange, something changed. Jason started coming home later, even on days when I got back early. It seemed he had decided to put in extra hours at work, perhaps. In his way, he was trying to address the imbalance between us. That day, I was in a particularly good mood, so I dove into my chores with more energy than usual. With Jason so busy lately, most of the housekeeping duties had fallen to me. I hadn't given it much thought until I found myself cleaning his room, which he hadn't tidied in quite some time. As I stepped inside, it was exactly as I had expected, empty bottles and cans were strewn everywhere, even on the bed. Amid the clutter, something caught my eye. A package, elegantly wrapped in gift paper, lay unobtrusively on the floor. Peering closer, I recognized the branding, it was from my favorite store. A flicker of excitement coursed through me as I realized my birthday was just around the corner. 
Could this be a surprise gift from Jason? Despite my curiosity, I decided to respect the surprise, pretending I hadn't seen it and leaving the package untouched. But when my birthday arrived, the gift never materialized. As the day went on, I casually asked Jason, Do you know what today is? Oh, right. It's your birthday, he replied, sounding nonchalant. Did you forget? I pressed, hoping for a hint of the surprise I had seen earlier. No, I remember, he responded. Aren't you happy with what I gave you last year? You know you're old enough not to need constant surprises. His words, so casually delivered, stung deeply. Jason returned to his room, leaving me puzzled and hurt. That mysterious box had sparked a flicker of hope, but now it only filled me with unease. Then he dropped a surprising announcement. I've got to go on a work trip abroad next week. This caught me off guard. A business trip to another country? I echoed, incredulous. Since when does your job involve international travel? You've never even been on a business trip outside the state. They just gave me this assignment, he replied simply. The whole situation felt increasingly bizarre. What was really going on? I had been feeling quite accomplished lately, convinced I deserved some recognition for my hard work. You should trust me, he had said, but it was hard to take those words seriously after stumbling upon that mysterious gift-wrapped box in his room. On the day he left for his so-called business trip, I waved him off in the early morning, but my curiosity soon overwhelmed me. I searched under the bed where I had seen the box, only to find it missing. Doubt gnawed at me. This wasn't just a regular business trip, was it? With that uneasy thought lingering, I dragged myself to work, struggling to concentrate. Several times, my hands froze mid-task as my mind replayed recent events on loop. Hey, are you okay? You seem out of it today, a co-worker asked, concern etched on their face. Oh, yeah, I just didn't get enough sleep. I replied, attempting to brush it off with a light-hearted excuse. Just then, my phone vibrated sharply, and a strange number flashed on the screen. I usually ignore calls from unknown numbers, but something compelled me to answer this one. Excuse me, I need to take this, I said, stepping outside to talk. It was the credit card company's call center on the line. As I listened, a whirlwind of thoughts about my husband, our recent issues, and the necessity of sharing my password raced through my mind until the representative's words cut through my confusion. This is from our debt protection service. It seems there has been a charge exceeding $40,000 on your account. The voice explained calmly. I was taken aback, disbelief and concern crashing over me. What on earth is going on? The conversation took a sharp turn when she dropped another bombshell. Yes, there was a charge for $91,000. That's impossible. Wait a second. I gasped, my heart racing. I dashed back to my desk, rifling through my wallet, only to find that my credit card was missing. That's the card I meant to have with me. I muttered in disbelief. Pardon me. Can you please halt that transaction? I asked urgently, phone pressed tightly against my ear. Yes, it's still pending, so we can stop it, she assured me, and a wave of relief washed over me. And please, can you handle the stolen card issue immediately? I don't have it with me, I added. Yes, ma'am, I'll take care of it right away, she responded. Even though the situation was partially resolved, the adrenaline still pumped through my veins. I hung up, my heart still racing. I'm sorry, I can't concentrate right now. I need to leave early. It seems my credit card was stolen and almost misused, and I have a lot to sort out. I explained to my boss, who understood and allowed me to leave. I caught the train home quickly, and as I checked my phone, I saw countless missed calls from Jason. It felt as though he was trying to confess something. I rushed home, kicked off my shoes, dropped my bag, 
and went straight to his office. His desk was a mess. But what caught my eye was his search history, luxury cruises, and travel plans for two. None of these were work-related. I hadn't been invited to any such event. The so-called business trip was clearly a cover for something else. My heart sank as the implications of what I had discovered washed over me. Scrolling through my old emails for any clues, I noticed a name that stood out, Billy. What the heck is this? I muttered, my anger rising. I wanted to slam the keyboard in frustration, but I forced myself to search for concrete proof of whatever was going on. My phone kept ringing incessantly as I pieced everything together. Oh my god. Just stop. I groaned, overwhelmed by the betrayal and chaos unfolding before me. Amidst the turmoil, I decided to use the password provided by the call center to check my credit card transaction history. I logged into my account and began scrolling through the records, my disbelief mounting with each entry. There it was, a transaction for an expensive handbag brand that caught my eye. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. Jason had used my credit card to indulge his mistress, Olivia, and even funded a supposed business trip abroad. The realization left me reeling. I had ignored several calls from him, but now, Summoning all my courage, I answered the phone. You finally picked up after I tried so many times, my husband said, his voice anxious. He immediately launched into a discussion about the credit card. Whose card? I asked pointedly. He hesitated before replying. You mean whose card? Well, it's easier to use a card than cash abroad, especially on work trips. Work trips? Or do you mean the luxury cruise and the getaway with Olivia? I countered sharply. He tried to deflect. Why are you asking about the cruise? That was for business entertainment, a fun time. Olivia and the designer bag, was Olivia happy with it? I asked coldly. Are you seriously trying to justify this by pretending you don't know what's going on? I pressed further, my voice steady but filled with pain. My husband faltered, the weight of the confrontation settling in. I understand. I understand. He repeated, desperation lacing his tone as he grasped at excuses. I know everything. I stated clearly. You tried to spend $91,000 on a luxury cruise and a vacation package for couples. You've been using my credit card to lavish Olivia with gifts. After a pause, he finally admitted. I'm sorry. I cheated. I'm sorry. But I can't come home until you reactivate the credit card. His plea hung in the air. Absurd and almost pitiful. Do you really think an apology and admission are enough to make all of this go away? I asked, the weight of his betrayal pressing down on me. The conversation had shifted irrevocably from mundane marital grievances to a stark, painful reckoning, feeling utterly betrayed. I told my husband, please spend the rest of your life at your resort, and then hung up before he could respond. Almost immediately, my phone started buzzing nonstop. The incessant ringing drove me to the edge, compelling me to turn off the device to escape the noise. Soon after, an email notification popped up, informing me that my husband's return flight was scheduled for noon five days later. I seized this window of opportunity to set my affairs in order, deciding to resolve everything before he could set foot back home. The next day, I began clearing out all his belongings from our house as part of my plan. On the second day, I gathered the courage to tell my in-laws about everything that had happened. I showed them the proof of his infidelity and misuse of our finances. They were shocked and deeply apologetic by the end of our conversation. They agreed to support me in getting a divorce, promising to ensure I would receive $2 million in alimony and vowing to recover the funds my husband had frivolously spent. As the day of my husband's return approached, I received a call in the early evening from my in-laws confirming that they had safely filed the divorce papers. Surprisingly, my soon-to-be ex-husband had only taken a credit card with him, leaving the rest of our finances untouched. However, the woman he was with had given him $91,000. Enraged by the unfolding events, she changed her flight, 
departing for Singapore before him without his knowledge. I found myself wondering why she hadn't just taken his plane ticket and visa, leaving him stranded. As I pondered this, my in-laws informed me that when my ex-husband returned to Singapore, he found the house empty, his connection to me severed, and his calls going straight to voicemail. In a desperate attempt to find refuge, he turned to my in-law's house, where he faced significant repercussions for his actions. After everything that had transpired, the final step was filing the divorce papers. My ex-husband had gotten himself into deeper trouble, and it didn't end with our separation. The woman he had been seeing was now demanding that he return the $91,000 she had given him. My in-laws relayed that after he repaid the money, they imposed strict conditions on him, almost as if he were back in high school. He was essentially under house arrest facing a 15-hour curfew, with his every move monitored by his family to ensure he paid off all the debts he owed. In the midst of all this, I took legal action myself, filing a $115,000 claim against the other woman involved in the affair. With help from my in-laws, I gathered the necessary information to pursue her financially. Once I did, it felt like the last piece of this painful puzzle was finally falling into place. It was a long and exhausting process, but when the claim went through, I felt a sense of closure. The legal side of things had been resolved, and it was time for me to focus on moving forward. When I returned to work the next day, my colleagues and bosses greeted me with surprising warmth and concern. Many of them had heard about my situation, and their kindness was palpable. Hey, are you okay? If you want to talk about anything, I'm here, one colleague offered gently. It was comforting to know I wasn't alone. I smiled gratefully and replied, Thank you. I'm doing all right. Just trying to get back into the swing of things. Maybe we can grab a drink after work. I'd appreciate the company. Making plans and looking forward to simple pleasures like a night out with friends felt rejuvenating. That evening, as we gathered at a local bar, the camaraderie soothed my spirit. We shared stories and laughter, and while the shadow of recent events lingered, it was overshadowed by the warmth of friendly faces. As I sipped my beer, the bitterness of the past few months seemed to dissolve slightly with each sip. I poured out my heart about the ordeal, and my colleagues listened empathetically. I'm just looking forward to putting all of this behind me. I confessed as the evening wound down. I think I'm ready to move forward and focus on the positives that the future holds. They raised their glasses to that, a silent acknowledgement of my resilience. To new beginnings, they echoed. As I left the bar that night, a sense of closure mingled with newfound hope. The support of my work community had buoyed my spirits, and I felt a deep appreciation for their presence in my life. It was a reminder that even in the aftermath of betrayal and heartache, the kindness of others could light the way forward. Looking ahead, I felt a cautious optimism. While the past couldn't be changed, the future was still mine to shape. With the legal matters settled and my boundaries firmly redrawn, I was slowly rebuilding a sense of normalcy. The path ahead wouldn't be without challenges, but I felt prepared to face them bolstered by the support of friends and a renewed sense of self. Indeed, it seemed that better days were on the horizon.